Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello, empaths. We have such a great show for you this week. We're going to be talking about empathic teens and strategies for helping families communicate more clearly. So joining us on the show is my friend Jennifer, who's a professor, writer, mom, and host of the amazing podcast called Reframing Me. Dr. Brubaker is an associate professor in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington. She's the author of Celebrity and the American Political Process, which takes a look at the intersection between media and politics through the lens of celebrity involvement in the political process. And after 20 years in academia, Jennifer has recently brought her scholarly research and family communication out of the classroom and into the podcast Reframing Me, which discusses both the evolution of parenting and family communication and the rediscovery of a woman's self as her own children become teenagers. Welcome to the show, Jen. Hi, Samantha. Hi, Denise. Thank you for having me. Oh, we're so excited. So... I want to start off before we dive into all of this conscious parenting and communicating and having empathic parents and teens. Let's just start with your podcast. How did you get the idea and what is your goal with doing Reframing Me? You know, I've been in academia now for my entire life, but I've been teaching for 20 years now, over 20 years now. And for the first number of it, I was kind of in the tenure years, you know, preschool years, I did them kind of simultaneously. In fact, I interviewed for my current position at UNCW when I was eight months pregnant um, with my first. And then I ended up getting tenure when he was in kindergarten. So everything kind of lined up really, really well, I guess. You could say it was really well. It was very exhausting, that's for sure. But, you know, as my kids have gotten older and I've kind of realized that, I've been doing two full-time jobs simultaneously in a way, because you know, when you're a professor, it's a little bit, I think my situation has been different than a lot of people's working mothers, because a lot of working mothers, most working mothers, especially pre-COVID days, were in the office or you know, they were at work. And so there was really a distinction between the stay-at-home moms and the working moms. Whereas someone in my profession, I had that flexibility. So I would be able to be at the kids' school and doing the kids' stuff and then doing my work at other times. So I was balancing these two different things, which was great, but exhausting. And then as the kids got older and reached those teen years, they started getting more independent like they're supposed to. And I started thinking, you know, I need something else. I need something for me. And I didn't really know what that was. And I guess, fortunately for me, I had those couple of years that we all had to kind of step back from everything. And I had a lot of time to reflect on it and just try to figure out, well, what direction did I want to go? What, you know, who am I at this point in time? Because it's been you know, 17 years since I've gotten to give any thought to who I am anymore. And then when COVID was past us and we started getting together again, I started to notice that other moms that I would run into and talk to that I hadn't seen in a couple of years were saying the same types of things. You know, Because our children had hit those transitional years during COVID, I feel like we jumped into the next stage without kind of that soft open that we should have gotten. And so parents were starting to say to me, other moms were saying that they just didn't know what to do with themselves anymore. They didn't know, you know, they weren't seeing anybody. They felt like they had, their worlds had gotten very small since their kids had gotten older. They weren't talking to parents in the lunchroom when we were helping with lunch duty. They weren't seeing people in pickup lines. They weren't at sports practices with their kids anymore. It just was a different environment and they didn't know who they were in this new environment and in this new life. And so, you know, simultaneously, over the last number of years, I've also started teaching in a graduate program, which I've learned is very different than teaching in an undergraduate program. 
you know, I've t spent my entire career teaching undergraduates. And while I love it, it's a very different environment than being where someone is working towards a higher education degree that is specifically targeted to what they want to do with their career than, hey, I'm taking a class that I just enjoy um, to, I hate to say, check a box sometimes, which is the reality of some classes. And other times it's to work towards something or to learn a skill, but different classes, different priorities. And I just know that family communication is one of those courses that when I teach it, they love it. You know, they all see their families in it. They all see things that for maybe the entirety of their lives, they didn't understand why something was. They didn't see. And hopefully then taking that knowledge with them as they left the class. The difference is, is that they're 20. The parenting stuff and the family dynamic stuff and the child you know, raising children's things, they just, you know, they're 20 years from that, 15, 20 years from that. And so to them, it's just a theoretical, which is great. But then I look at these moms that I know, and for them, it's a reality. And so I was. It couldn't help but think that that information that's helpful, but yet just theoretical to a 20 year old could be both helpful and practical to a 40 year old. And so that's kind of, you know, all of those pieces coming together and a lot of meditation and a lot of journaling is what led me to create this podcast. All right. So you mentioned about how moms feel this sense of who am I now when we go through that stage of being, it's so different when they're little and they need you and then they get into high school and they don't, but they do. Then they leave the nest. Our kids are very similar in age. Denise's kids are a little bit older, but we've all been there trying to figure out how do I talk to my kids now? What are some tips and strategies you have for connecting with teens especially little empathic teens who are feeling everything and, you know, expressing themselves and confused and filled with doubt. Right. I think the biggest, you know, in fact, in the very first episode of the show, I started with this. And I think that I started with it because I think it's so much the foundation for moving into this stage is this idea of trying to balance stability and change. And in family communication, we refer to this as a relational dialectic that there are two concepts that on the surface seem to be polar opposites, stability and change. But the reality is we need to maintain both of them in order to have a healthy functioning relationship. And so we're constantly navigating a balance between the two. And as they're moving into and moving through these teenage years, it's one that we are constantly needing to navigate because once they get to this tween early teen point, like I, my, one, my youngest is 13. So as she's getting to this stage, I need to change with her because she's changing so rapidly. I can't expect to be the same parent to her that I was to her five years ago. Similarly, I can't be the same parent to her that I am to my almost 17 year old, who's my oldest. And because he's at a different point than she is. And then I have my middle, who's almost 15, who is at a different stage somehow than both of them, despite the fact that they're all so close in age. But that's the thing with teenagers. Is they're constantly changing and constantly evolving. And I think a trap that so many parents fall into is they are a parent, they know how to be a parent, and this is a parent. But when the child that you are parenting is not the same person, you can't expect to be the same parent that you were either. And so I think that that's a primary thing that parents of teens need to understand is that no matter how good your strategies worked when they were five or they were eight or 10 or whatever, that can't be the same parenting that you use when they're 15. So I think that that's the biggest concept that parents need to understand. And that's the most challenging thing too, because we get set, we're like, hey, we got this down. And just as we feel like we've got this down, it all gets changed again. 
And so being able to be flexible and adaptive in our parenting is huge. And, you know, I think that I tend to default to when I think because of my background, when I think of parenting and I use the term parenting, it all comes back to communication to me and that sense of communicating with them differently at a different level, having different expectations, managing our expectations, listening to them, having that open communication and open dialogue. It, you know, so much of what I try to, so much of what I try to preach sometimes is it all kind of comes back to communication, recognizing the power that you have in the words that you say to them and recognizing what they're saying and what the power is in the words that they're saying and just understand that everything, highly functioning families tend to really understand that everything is interaction based. And that's that's really when we're studying families and from a communication perspective, we look at it that everything is interaction based, that no, you can't look at one exchange without recognizing that it's built on something that happened prior and it's going to impact something that's going to happen in the future. And families who are the most functioning with children or with teenagers or, or even in couples, realistically, it's it, everything that we do is based on something that has happened in the past and then it influences our future interactions. And one of the concepts that I've always found fascinating with communication is this idea of punctuation. We all do it. We all have the tendency to punctuate everything from our perspective. I did this because you did that. Well, I only did this because you did that. And we always are taking it one step farther and going back that nothing is ever on us. It's always based on the interaction that happened before. And that's something that's so unique about families is this long shared history that we have of these transactions. And that's something that is, you know, everything is transactional. And so if we're constantly doing that, we can recognize, though, that we also can make our future interactions better by what we do in this current one can then impact how it's going to be. So I guess it's that same kind of thing about insanity and, you know, expecting to get different results by doing the same thing over and over again. Well, if you know that when you talk to your teenager this way, this is the response you're going to get, I guarantee you, you're going to get the same response next time. So if you want something different, then possibly try a different approach with them, a more positive approach, because you can walk into the same situation in a very different light you know you and how how do you frame something as how do you look at it what is your personal frame that you're looking at it through what is the perspective if you ask your teen to do something just because they don't jump and do it right then doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't intending on doing it or that you know they, they are not going to be helpful to you or that they're not listening or they're being disrespectful or any of those things. It could just mean that they had a different priority for doing this. And then you came in and asked why it wasn't done and got angry that it wasn't done, but it was just a difference in priorities. And so there are so many different perspectives. And by maybe looking at it like that, or if your teenager is you know, snapping at you or back talking or lashing out or instead of our knee jerk reaction is, of course, that to be defensive and, or you know, to be at them and yelling at them and screaming at them and, you know, getting into an argument. What's going to happen in that? Well, you can again, that transactional thing, you can look back and say, this is what's happened in the past. I know what's going to happen. Now, the more I yell at them, the more they're going to come back and yell at me. And then we're going to have this negative exchange. Whereas if you recognize that it's probably coming from something else. And, you know, there's some other cause of this. And if you recognize that and can instead come at it from a place of what's going on, you know, what's bothering you, you know, what has happened? Tell me about your day. See what, see what the problem is, because the problem's coming from somewhere else. But oftentimes our teens tend to take it out on us 
which realistically, if you think of it, this is where they should be able to take it out. It's not fair to us to be on the receiving end of things, but there's that concept of non-volition with family is that we don't get to choose our family but that's good because they don't get to choose us either. And so it gives us that kind of, that safety and that comfort that we know that our mom is always gonna be there and she's gonna love us and she's gonna, no matter how much we take things out on her, which that doesn't help is the mom feeling like, well, gosh, why are you always taking things out on me? But it's that you've given them that unconditional love that shows them that they can take out their frustrations from the world on you. And while they shouldn't be doing that, you can also kind of keep that from happening from when it does start to happen, recognizing what is causing this and what is underneath this and starting to get to that problem, which is the root of their issue and trying to help them deal with that and try to show them how to use their channel their feelings appropriately, I guess. Yeah. And get, and get you and them off the defensive with those strategies. I think that's so important. So what's interesting is being the mother of adult children and having worked in education with teenagers for many, many years, what it really comes back to is encouraging people to be who they came here to be, not who you think they're supposed to be. Every person on this planet wants to feel respected. They want to feel seen. They want to feel valued. And my question would be because you have your background in communications and undergraduate work right now. And I say this to a lot of my friends that have adult children, how grateful we are that our children grow up bombarded with the intensity of social media, because I think the impact of that on the familial unit, as well as the individual child is so Sometimes I I worry. I worry a lot for these kids because they're trying to navigate a world that has never been experienced before. And if people are stuck in the old paradigms of parenting or relationships, it can limit them really stepping into finding a way to and, and survive is a heavy word. But for some kids, that's what it is. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that, you know, I mean, I know I personally saw that a lot during COVID that, you know, my children really, two of them in particular, really gravitated towards online platforms for interaction with people and, you know, meeting other people and living in almost these, you know, these simulated worlds. But that was the only world that they had at that point. And, you know, you're right. They, you know, parents who don't embrace And embrace, I think, is probably not necessarily the proper word for it, but social media is here, you know, and, you know, my background is also it's in media studies. I mean, that's, you know, media studies, media effects. That's what my PhD is, you know, focused on partially. And it's here and we need to we need to embrace it. We need to figure out how can we incorporate this into our lives. And I oftentimes get asked by people, you know, when, when should we let our kids have phones? You know, when should we let them text? When should we let them use social media? And, you know, my answer is oftentimes very different than a lot of people's answers. And my feeling is as early as possible. And that I know a lot of people kind of look back at, you know, how could you say that? You know, we need to keep it. But my thoughts on that are the sooner you give them access to this, the more you can look over their shoulder and teach them how to use it properly. And, you know, like my seven-year-old niece, she has, you know, she has a phone and, you know, she has a phone. I mean, she has an iPad, I guess. She has an iPad and an Apple watch is what she has for safety purposes, the Apple watch. And then she has the iPad, I guess, to just call us all the time. But to give them these things early on, it allows you to go in through their text messages, to read what kinds of things they're saying to their friends. I know I gave my children phones basically as early as they wanted them or iPods. I guess my oldest had an iPod first. And, you know, when they see their text messages, set up rules, know that they're, you're going through things. When you see something that you don't like, that way you have the ability to kind of teach them how to use it properly. You know, we had strict rules on, but they only came from learning experiences that were made these rules happen. 
you know, things like you don't take part in a group text. Group texts are not good. Group texts over three people, you know, there were ones for each of the classes, you know, their whole homerooms had a group text and things got out of control in the group texts and things were, you know, said and screenshotted. And so that's when you start, okay, this is, you see how this is happening, you know, dance like no one's watching, but text like it's going to be read by, you know, in court kind of thing. You know, you want to look and realize that you can't put things down that you don't want someone to screenshot. You can't send a picture that you don't want somebody to share and you can hold their hand and show them. But I mean, I kind of have made the metaphor in the past of giving someone a cell phone and social media use is the equivalent of giving someone a car and the ability to drive. You know, my oldest just got his license. My middle, it just took driver's ed. I wouldn't let him go out and drive the car. There's, there are rules to it. He has to spend, you know, by law, 60 hours driving in the car with me before I give him the, you know, the ability to drive by himself. Well, if you just hand a 15 year old, you know, Snapchat or TikTok and say, okay, you know, now you've reached 15, the magic age, here's these technologies. Well, what do they do with it? They haven't been taught how to properly use it. And whereas I think if you give, you know, I mean, now it's the age seems to be younger, but you are constantly monitoring it and you are talking to them about it and you are going through and you're sitting and watching TikToks with them. And, you know, it does place the burden on the parents that you have to be familiar with the technology. You have to be on it watching their phones. You have to be reading text messages and you have to be communicating with them. But the reality is we should be kind of doing those things anyways, but now we're kind of forced to because of that. So my perspective on social media might be a little bit different than others, but that's the reasoning behind why I'm coming from where I'm coming. Yeah. You know, I gave my kids phones in middle school and I had my techie friend put so many restrictions on their phones. We don't know how to turn them off now all these years later. My kids can't look up bathing suits. Last night, my daughter was trying to look up bathing suits and it was like, sorry, this is restricted. She can't go to Victoria's Secret or Pink. Nothing. Oh, that's funny. And I'm like, well, oh, well, I don't know how to turn it off. So I'm just leaving it as is. That's funny because my... um nearly 17 year old still has to have app requests approved because I can't figure out how to turn it off. And he's not like the techie one, you know, and so I'll still get a, you know, that he requests an app and, you know, I mean, thankfully he's, you know, an easygoing kid and, you know, doesn't, yeah care. But that, yes, I get that. I completely agree. We, we've turned on things that we're not hundred percent sure how to turn off. No. And I told, I have all their passwords to open their phone written yes. down. And I said, if I'm paying the phone bill, absolutely, <laughs> I need to have access. It doesn't mean I'm looking at it and going through it, but I just think as a safety thing, you need to have that. And I watch too much Dateline. So exactly. And you know, that is, you know, and having that access to things and knowing, you know, I, I can get into any of their stuff. And you know, the reality is they can get into my stuff too. It, there's never been a, and that's when I say about being open with your kids, we kind of have this like, yeah, they can unlock my phone. You know, of course they can. And I can unlock their phones. And they know that I can do that. I can go through their phones if I wanted to. But that's something also when we talk about this changing and this evolution of our parenting over time is that whereas I am perfectly okay with going through my 13 year old phone if I want to, and I wouldn't have any qualms about telling her I'm, you know, looking through your phone. Whereas I would go a little bit less through my 15 year olds. I don't really necessarily, it's kind of, we're at that point that it's like a privacy thing. I wouldn't look at my 17 year olds unless there was a reason, you know, if there was, if I had a concern, but ideally if I had a concern, I would go to him about it first. It's not like I would just be delving through his phone go, looking for evidence. I mean, if I had that kind of situation come up, then, you know, by all means I have that ability, but you know, a lot of times I'll see in these parenting groups that, you know, on Facebook and stuff that people post, you know, I just found this from in my child's room, you know, what do I do? And it's like the fact that that's your first thing is to ask strangers, like ask your child about it. You know, hey, do you have, you know, do you have this secret TikTok account? You know, do you have a, you know, are you vaping? Have you, you know, whatever it is, talk to you. Know, I found this in your room. Can you explain what it is? 
And by having that communication, but a lot of times that's not people's knee jerk reaction to actually just communicate with their kids. And I can't help but feel like sometimes I think that might be the problem of how we got here too a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I agree completely. So we've been getting a lot of emails since COVID, but really it's still amping up. I think you'd agree too, Denise, from a lot of a lot of moms and caregivers who are saying, I just feel overwhelmed and swamped. I'm trying to do it all and be it all, but like something's got to give. I can't focus on work and kids and family and, and working out. And then, you know, there's no time for it. And I remember when I first met you, it was early, like on a field trip or something. And I remember saying something like I was tired and you were like, oh, I've been up since I think you said 3.30 because you- <laughs> It's probably like, back at that time. What? <laughs> tell people you're, a little bit about your amazing self-care routine. Well, I can tell you it was probably four. I used to get up at four regularly. Um, I do not do those kind of crazy things anymore. Sometimes that's that's the benefit of now having older children. Um, I, I get to sleep till 5.45 now. Woo! Um, woo, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I know. Wild and crazy. But- First of all, I probably should preface some of this, that that was also the flexibility of the career that I that I have, that I could, and I used to say that I would rather do a trade-off of, I would rather be with my kids at 4 p.m., picking them up from school, doing their after-school stuff, being there to help them with homework or taking them to practice or whatever. My sacrifice was then at 4 a.m. when I, you know, technically nine to five hours kind of thing should have been at work. 4 a.m. was when I was working. And so I had a little bit of flexibility with my career, but I also know that had I not had that flexibility, I probably knowing me, I would have had used that time. I would have been working out at 4 a.m. or something like that because I wouldn't have had that. But that was how at that point in time, I needed to work wise, small children wise, trying to maintain some degree of self care. And my self care back then was probably a lot less than it is now, realistically. So for those moms that, you know, maybe, maybe it'll get a little bit easier, and you'll get to have a little bit more of it. But that's I've always been a I am a disciplined schedule person. I know what I have to get done during the day and what I want to get done during the day. And I schedule it all in. And yes, I schedule in my workouts every day. I know, you know, I want to work out from 30 minutes to 75 minutes at some point during the day. Any of that, you know, obviously it's going to vary depending on what is going on the rest of my day. But I know that every day that I am physically able to fit a workout in, I am going to. And some days I look at my schedule and all I can do is I've got 30 minutes and okay, that's great. Other days I look at my schedule and I'm like, all right, I have a 60 minute block. I can totally do it. And some days I'm doing, you know, 30 minutes before I shower and like to the sweaty part so that then I can shower and then I come back and do 10 minutes of core later, you know, I mean, and so sometimes it's, it's piecemealed out. I always schedule it in. It's the same thing with my meditation. I get up earlier than I would if I didn't meditate, but I have set up a, you know, pretty strict morning routine for myself. And all it means is that I want to be out of bed at six o'clock. Well, if I want to be out of bed at six o'clock, I could set my alarm and get up at six o'clock, but I set my alarm and I get up at 545 and I do my stretches that I do and I do my breathing things that I do and I do a 10 minute meditation and take out the AirPods and put them in the case and I'm up at six o'clock. And so I'm a strong believer in having that schedule and having that routine. And, you know, it is a sense of discipline is really what it is, because you can't do it for be, you can't be motivated to do it because motivation is going to go away. And so, you, you know, you need to be more disciplined in it that this is what I'm going to do and eventually kind of get used to it, I guess. But that's the schedule is a very big thing and priorities. And, you know, priorities for me is always been a what's more important for me to do this or me to do that? And so, you know, when 
I don't watch TV really. You know, the only time I ever watch TV, two times. I watch TV when I do laundry. That's my reward. I get to watch TV when I do laundry. And, uh, you know, we'll oftentimes we'll have shows together that maybe our family will sit down and watch in the evening kind of thing. And that's, that's really it. Do I enjoy TV shows? And would I like to watch TV shows? Absolutely. You know, I, I do. I would, I would like to, but I've had to prioritize and I know that someday, someday I'll get to watch TV again. And there's going to be so much TV for me to watch too, because I'm going to have years to catch up on. But that's just because to me, those other things have been a priority. Just like for some people, maybe what they need for self-care is, you know, an hour of watching TV in the evening by themselves to decompress. And absolutely no judgment at all. If that's what you need, if an hour of Real Housewives is going to give you the uh, you know, internal Zen that you need, then go for it. You know, for me, I need, I'm, I'm like a puppy. I have to get some movement, some exercise every day, or I, I go a bit crazy. So for me, for my self-care, you know, movement, exercise, training, that was really important to me. And so I've kept that up. You know, similarly, I've always kind of had the trade-off of what's most important to me to be with the kids and to play with them when they're little and to be you know involved in everything or to have my house be clean and have my house be picked up and have my house be perfect did it make me crazy that the house was always a disaster absolutely but there was limited time so i had to prioritize and to me playing with the kids was uh, you know important just like my job has always been it's, I know it sounds so silly to say, but I've always kind of looked at my job like that's my free time. That's my me time. I'm like, some people play tennis. I go to work, you know, but I've kind of for years I had to do that because I knew that I was kind of investing in my future, so to speak. I knew that I wanted to have this career for the long term and I didn't have, whereas I had a lot of luxuries in my job um, as a mom, I also didn't have the luxury that some careers do that you can, you know, take those few years off and kind of then go back and find a new job. You know, you don't quit academia for a few years and then come back and find another tenure track position. It doesn't, it doesn't happen. So that was, you know, I've prioritized different things in that capacity. So priorities to me, I think have been a, and realizing that whatever you're doing is enough, you know, you just do as, and I, that's something that unfortunately has come to me much later. And I think that that has really helped with, I mean, if you want to talk self-care and an internal Zen type of thing, recognizing that whatever I'm doing, it's enough earlier years, nothing was ever enough to me. I never, you know, I would push myself and push myself and push myself and it was still never enough. And now recognizing that, you know what, I tried, I did my best. This, this is what I got. And recognizing that has definitely helped me a lot. Yeah. Oh gosh. I remember when my kids were little and I was working, I used to count, I would lay in bed at night and I would count how many hours I got to spend with them and how many hours I had to spend at work. Yep. And if work won, I fell asleep guilty. Mm -hmm. it was just, oh, it was terrible. And so I always try to remind parents and caregivers that every stage of our life is a season. You yes. know, it's not your life. I think when you're in it, you know, in the, in the mix of it and you're on the floor and you're messy and all of it feels like your whole life, but it's a season and every season changes and we have to change with it. I do like what you said about discipline because the motivation sure as anything does pass. So you've yes. got to, you got to commit to it. But yeah, I think that's super important. The, the other aspect of the self-care and we have a really varied audience. There are single parents who are doing it all on their own, who may not have the resources to right. go to a gym or to the luxury of having a, a co-parent or there's so many variables, but what you're, also is so, so, so important is learning the self-care. So as your children transition into that next stage of more independence, you don't hit that place of I'm not needed anymore. And you see it from when they're little to tweens, from older teens into young adulthood. And if you haven't established any form of self-care or self-preservation, there's a very deep, I mean, I think for most parents, who have enjoyed that role, there is a loss. There's a grief when your children grow up 
and you have to redefine the parameters of what your life looks like and what your relationship looks like with your children. But if you've done any little thing throughout that process that keeps you knowing you, it makes those transitions just a tiny bit easier. Absolutely. I know that that was a a driving force in me really focusing on this podcast was, you know, there, there was a time that I kind of hit that I started to look at it like, okay, it's all downhill from here. Like, you know, everything's really good. I'm like, I I love my, I love my life the way that it is. And being someone who is really prone to anxiety and concern about the future, you know, I was awake at night, most night, it's, you know, just thinking about how, what this is going to be, like, everything's going to be gone, they're all going to leave me. And, you know, then I'm going to be left with what with nothing and looking at it. And I think that so many women do, it's just our, it's a cultural standard that is kind of put on us. I mean, when you look at how it is always framed of, you know, empty nest or syndrome and leaving the nest and, you know, it's like, is if it's like, now it's empty, and it's ba- empty is bad. You know, that's what we've been trained to, to see things as, to just be individuals who are living it for those tiny moments when you get a speck, a crumb, a, you know, a phone call, a visit, and we just kind of what? We're going to be nothing in between once our children are grown. And I don't think that that's true. And I don't want that to be true. I hope that's not true. I mean, I'm, not, I'm really hanging on to the fact that that's not going to be true. But I, I don't want that to be true. And I don't think it should be, you know, and I, I know that in one of the episodes I had, I did the math and I'm like, I intend on living to like at least a hundred. I mean, I don't do all this yoga and take all these supplements and eat all this, you know, healthy food for me not to, that's my goal. And I'm 46, you know, so what, what is it going to be? Am I just going to exist for the next, you know, 50 plus years? I hope not. So that's, I think, the way that we have been trained to think, and we need to untrain that, that it's not like we get to this point and our kids are raised and like, okay, well, I guess I'm, you know, I'm not going to cure cancer. I'm not having any more kids. I guess I'm done. Society doesn't need me anymore. And that's not what it is. And so that's what I, I'm really hoping to do with this show is kind of create this community of women who recognize that this isn't the end. You know, there is life after raising children, like, and there is your life after raising children. It's just a matter of trying to figure out what that is for you and you know, ideally that you can have support in figuring this out. And so, you know, I've tried to balance this show. Initially, it just started off that it was just going to be this family communication perspective, because my thought is, well, if nothing else, um, I'm getting stuff out there and hopefully somebody will, you know, do it. And it's like writing a journal article that hopefully somebody will read someday. But it is, you know, it is scholarly material and scholarly research. So I'm like, if nothing else, it checks my box on my career path that I'm doing this. But as I got into it, and I'm realizing that it's more than that. It's not just how we communicate with our teens now. It's also, you're right, putting that in the bank. It's starting to invest in ourselves for, you know, you you save for the kids' college fund. Same kind of thing. Like, we need to put our own college fund here. Like, we need to put stuff in the bank for us for when they get to that point so that we have something left and we have something we can withdraw from that we can use. And so that's also, and so I started these little Jenna Zen prompts as well that are, because I'm not a good journaler. I have never, you know, I'm, I'm a great yogi. I'm a great, you know, I'm great with meditation. I always feel like when I sit down to write in a journal, it's dear diary. I can't believe what happened today. You know, like I'm nine years old. That's what I feel when I would journal in the past. And so, you know, having a prompt to start from is kind of what has helped me build a journaling practice. And so I have in these Jenna Zen episodes, I've put forth a prompt and I try to do it in all the episodes as well, but put forth a prompt of, you know, the first one we started with, I think was the first one that I started my recent journal and practice with this idea of, you know, what would I be? Who would I be if I was truly free? 
you know, and it's like, wow, I don't really, these aren't things you think about and a normal, but it's a foundation for building up to finding that inner piece of you that it, it's, it never goes out. That little spark of who you were before you were a mom, it doesn't go out. You've just got to kind of find it again. And it's not going to be the same that it was, but you need to kind of figure out what it's going to become. And so I've kind of put these prompts out there in these Jenna Zen episodes as well as a, another facet of raising teenagers, essentially, because it's not only raising teenagers and communicating with teenagers and with our families, it's also, you know, hey, let's just put a little five minutes in here or there to kind of for ourselves to figure those things out about ourselves as well. And so, you know, the approach that I've kind of tried to take with this is multifaceted. Like I'm going to give you the knowledge. I'm going to give you what I have because I have all of these years of information in my head, you know, all of this reading that I've done, all of these lectures I've put together, all of this research that I've done and I want to share it with somebody who's going to need it and use it like now, you know, not just people who are going to use it. Maybe it'll be interesting in 20 years if I remember it kind of thing. And so that's one facet of it. And then this other facet is this self-reflection and this finding, you know, your inner peace, this inner Zen, this inner joy that I think so many people have lost because realistically that's going to come back and help your family too. If you have this inner joy it's going to come out and it's going to make your family better too. And you make your communication better too, because as our kids get older and need us more, if we don't have that, then we're going to take that out on them in some capacity. Just like I said before, that if they are upset or they're having a bad day or something is wrong in their lives, it comes out on us. It's the same thing the other way. And so if we're sitting there, mad that we haven't seen our, you know, our teenagers all weekend and feeling lonely and what do I have? And I don't have anything. And I'm just sitting here waiting for you to come home. And then, you know, they're out again. And it's like, now you're angry that they're gone again. Are you angry that they're gone again or angry that you're alone again and that you don't have anything to fill that void? And then when they do come home, then what do you do? Then you're confrontational possibly with them that, oh, it's good that you can stop by. You know, it's nice that you can be here a little bit. Well, it's going to put them on the defensive about it too. And then what? Then they're going to look at you like you need them to make yourself whole. And Samantha, when you mentioned about conscious parenting, that's really part of it is that when you need your child to make you whole, to complete you, that doesn't mean you have a good relationship with them. That's like, I mean, it's very close to codependency, really. And, you know, it's those enmeshed relationships. Whereas if you have something of yourself and something for yourself, then you can be happier and you can be content. And then when they can be happy and they can be content and you can have these connected lives instead of having enmeshed lives that depend on one another. And so, yes, the Genizen are ideally is trying to complement the family communication with teens. And then ideally, I want to kind of build this community up so that people don't necessarily feel like they're alone in this. Because a lot of times that is the third, you know, that's the other missing piece of the puzzle is we feel like we are alone in this, like this, nobody else is going through this. Yes, we are. We're all going through it. Everybody is going through it, but it's not comfortable for many of us to talk about, you know, the issues that we have with our teenagers are oftentimes uncomfortable issues to talk about with other people. So it's sometimes it's because there are bigger issues, they're more embarrassing, or there are more uncomfortable issues to talk about. Or, you know, sometimes it's just a, you feel like it's a violation of your teenager's privacy, or it's their story to tell, it's their life. And so for a variety of reasons, we kind of, we don't, even with our closest friends, sometimes we don't have this ability to talk to other people. So we end up trying to manage these issues on our own and feel like we have to keep these inside. And so, you know, that's my other facet is ideally, I would like to kind of create create a community that you can talk to other people. You can, you know, when people reach out with questions, you know, which thankfully I, thankfully I have had people reach out, you know, 
And so, you know, when people do come, it's nice to know that you have other people who are feeling the same way and possibly is, you know, that is when you mentioned before about this, this world of social media and this world of technology and, you know, how we have to accept it's a different world. But that also brings about good things like we can talk to people who we, you know, don't know our children and can, you know, we can share with them and we can get advice from them and we can have a friendship essentially with them when it's not like, hey, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to see them and their kid and we're going to be looking at each other like, I know this about your kid and you know this about my kid and making it uncomfortable. So there's a lot of different things that come into play with these different parts to try to make us whole, essentially. Yeah. You know, my friend Deb has a saying, when I take care of me, my whole world falls into place. And Mm -hmm. I think that is so true. That is so true. We are out of time, but thank you so much for coming on Enlightened Empaths. Tell everyone where they can find Reframing Me. I am on all of the normal places you get your podcasts, on Apple, on Spotify, on iHeart. It's Reframing Me. Um, There is a Facebook page, Reframing Me, but then there's also, we've started a Facebook group called Reframing Me, a podcast community um, where we can kind of connect with other people who are all in the same position that we are, or all the socials, right? Um, As Reframing Me on Instagram and on TikTok, every once in a while, you might get a little lucky and see me trying to make a little TikTok about things. So, but yes, I would love to have um, people come to the show and just kind of learn about these different ideas and share with me their experiences. Also, you can email me, Jen, at reframing-me.com. Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. I will put all that and links to your show in our show notes and on our Facebook page too. Thank you again, Jennifer, for coming on the show. I hope everyone listening has a fantastic week. Please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.